um, you know, we had a little bit of time before uh, this evening to, to talk about some of the similarities and differences and between our work. And certainly at, at a, the most basic level, I think we're, we're both interested in exploring the invisible. In the case of Adam, it's exploring the far distant gal galaxies light years away. For me, it's uh, what's right beneath our feet in the underground underworld, so to speak. So I think we'll, we'll uh, I'll give an introduction to my world, and then hopefully during the discussion, after Adam's talk, we'll get a sense of what we do. At base similarities, we both use our heads. In Adam's case, it's a kind of complex mathematics. This is actually a 1,700-year-old BC, what people think is the first approximation of the square root of two, but kind of fundamental mathematics. I also, similarly, I use my head, but more as a battering ram <laughs> right here. <laughs> for getting into the blue holes. And this is, you know, literally a lot of what we do is physically search and put ourselves into these kind of mysterious, invisible, beneath our feet worlds. And I think, yeah, and you just kind of go in there and you don't know what you're gonna find. And my mother, when she saw this, her, her comment was, uh, you went to school for how many years to do that? <laughs> but once you do get into these places, you really are kind of become a physically a time traveler. You get into these time capsules. And what I used to consider, again, before really thinking about the kind of stuff that, that Adam works on is that some of the things we found in these holes were taking us back to what I would call deep time, which is very shallow time by his standards, as you'll see, but really to the, the origin of the Earth. If we think about the Earth about four and a half billion years old, it's only in the last two and a half billion years where we've even had enough oxygen to keep life alive. But the earliest forms of life were microbial forms of life. And as you'll see, blue holes are kind of a modern day analogy for what we think some of this, uh, these early forms of life evolved out of. And they're forms of life that didn't leave a fossil record. So we look for these, these places on Earth where we can study them. At about two and a half billion years before present, we had what people refer to as the oxygen revolution, where a certain type of bacteria, you've probably heard of cyanobacteria, outcompeted a lot of the other organisms and microbes. And the byproduct of the cyanobacteria is the oxygen that, that makes our Earth livable. And it's really at the, the end of the timeline where the life as we know it comes across. And as um, Andrew Knoll, an evolutionary biologist, said, if you think that you know, humans are the icing on the cake. The cake is really made up of bacteria. And I think that's a, a, a nice way to think about, about this sort of evolution. So I don't know, it's hard to see with the, the light on me. How many divers you can yell out? How many divers in the audience? Oh, quite a few. How, how many cave divers? Oh, not many, good. Job security. Um, <laughs> but if you, you can kill the light, thanks, guys. Um, for those of you, that's actually what an underwater cave looks like. Um, I take full credit for the photo. As I know, our Sadie, our photo editor from the magazine, Sadie Courier, she'll see that's about as skilled as my photos are. And I'll show a lot of beautiful photos, and I, but I take no credit for them. That's what a blue hole looks like looking up from about 100 meters, over 300 feet, looking at the entrance as two divers uh, descend down into the hole. And then you get into these otherworldly sorts of situations where you really feel like you're in this inner space. That's uh, an offshore blue hole. So I'll talk about two kinds of blue holes. Offshore, and that's in Long Island, Bahamas. That's the deepest known blue hole in the world. It's about 660 feet deep. And there's inland blue holes. That one's in the pine yards in Abaco, Bahamas. So let me get a little bit into the anatomy of a blue hole. If you think about it, here, I'll give you the Reader's Digest version. You have rain coming down through the atmosphere picks up a little bit of carbon dioxide, becomes slightly acidic, hits limestone, which you could think of as calcium carbonate, almost chalk-like. It can eat away and form reservoirs of water down beneath our feet. But that's just how you get the fresh water down there. How you get the lateral cave formation is where that fresh water meets the salt water that's at the equivalent of where the sea level is, that's come in either through cave conduits or through the limestone itself. It's as if we're standing on a sponge, and there's many places in the world that have this kind of geology. Well, there's a chemical reaction that occurs at that interface, at the halocline, and that eats away the cave. 
then when sea level falls or rises, depending on the ice ages, for example, 20,000 years ago, the sea level around the Bahamas and Florida was about 400 feet lower than present day. You'll get cave formation at that level, sea level will rise, stop for a while, you get caves forming at that level, and that's how you can get miles and miles of lateral cave passageway. So as I mentioned, these, these caves are modern day analogs for what we think these ancient oceans were like. So we have this fresh water, lighter fresh water, and it's got oxygen in it. Uh, and then you've got this denser salt water beneath it, and you've got over hundreds of thousands of years organic matter, so you've got plants and trees and animals falling in and sinking to the bottom there. There's microbes that actually feed off this, get their energy from these carbon sources, and they combine with the sulfate that's found in seawater, and the byproduct is this sewer gas, or hydrogen sulfide, which we've all smelled, the rotten eggs, sulfurous springs, and kind of very poisonous and gaseous form. And there's a whole set of life that lives in that uh, layer as well, off this hydrogen sulfide. So you've got different forms of life that we can study from a, a genetic perspective, as well as looking at them in context and get a sense of what life might have been like billions of years ago. Let me just show you some of the forms of life that we find in there. This is the big stuff. This is the recent finds. That's Dr. Tom Eiliff, who's catching a lucifuga, a blind cave fish. Most of the creatures are blind. There's no reason to put your evolutionary energy into eyes or optic nerves. And these creatures have probably remained unchanged for about 200 million years. Some of them not only found just in the Bahamas, not just in underwater caves, but only have seen them in one cave. And it shows you how little we know about uh, this very fragile ecosystem. No eyes, translucent. That's a, a remnant eye with no optic nerve, which tells us that it probably evolved from originally from the oceans. That's a new class of crustaceans that was found in the Bahamas in the 70s, and we've found subsequent species, uh, Remipedia. So that was a major find out of the blue holes. There's a close-up. They have venomous fangs. But um, this is about the extent of my experience with uh, astronomy, which is my screensaver <laughs> on my Mac. <laughs> Um, so, you know, I assume I was brought here to make Adam look particularly smart. Um, but it did, when I did see this, it does, uh, at least metaphorically, I make the link to what goes on uh, with potential forms of life in certain places like Europa and Mars. And that brings us back to the blue holes, and that's actually a shot of 30 feet deep, 10 meters deep, and if you were diving down descending, you would hit what looks like these rings of Saturn. And that's the hydrogen sulfide layer. And the pink is actually the pigmentation in the cells of the bacteria. It's that voluminous. And the white is sulfur, elemental sulfur, that's broken down in the, the chemosynthesis or the metabolic process of the bacteria. So you're literally descending down into this noxious layer. You start to smell the rotten egg smell before you even get to it. And obviously you're wearing a face mask so you're not smelling it through your nose. It's actually uh, diffusing through the pores in your skin, through your wetsuit, or even if you're wearing a dry suit. And you know you're staying in it too long once you stop smelling it because it's actually deadened your olfactory nerves. And you're, sometimes the metal starts to change color so we try to move quickly through it but sometimes that's where we do quite a bit of our sampling. And uh, w what happens physiologically is you have the uh, hydrogen sulfide uh, stops the hemoglobin from binding to the red blood cells and it impedes oxygen uptake. You might start to get tingly lips or whatnot. We talked to a lot of physiologists, no clear answers on what long-term exposure may do. We did quite a few, we did about 150 dives just in this one hole. There's some evidence, that's, that's actually what I looked like before the expedition. <laughs> and there were some, some slight physiological changes afterwards, but We've, you know, we've dealt with them subsequently. So, how am I doing for time? Maybe I should get off the stage. <laughs> um, but uh, l let me just go on to one of the other, uh, quickly, one of the other scientific questions that was at the heart of the expedition was looking at the natural history of the Caribbean. As it ends up, this anoxic salt water, no oxygen salt water, is a great place to preserve fossils, including collagen, where you can get DNA out of. So we did a lot of work excavating. Here's just some examples. That's in 90 feet of water. It's probably about a 13,000-year-old owl roost. So an owl would 
go out of the cave, go hunting, come back, uh, whatever it ate, lizards, birds, uh, small mammals, it would uh, digest the food, but it, they actually regurgitate up their, the bones. So that whole little meter square excavation pit, we found about 26 new species, either unknown to science, didn't know they lived in that part of the world, or we learned that they had somehow gone extinct. Lots of uh, land tortoises, species we didn't know existed, small mammals, birds of prey, crocodiles that we didn't know existed in this area. They're related to the highly endangered uh, Cuban crocodile found in just one small wetland area. Lucayan Indian burial grounds, there's no surviving descendants of the Lucayan Indians. So there's a lot of mystery. There's not a good record on what happened with human migration when uh, Paleo Indians came out of the Orinoco Basin in Venezuela. There's our expedition really yielded some interesting answers, but many more questions about why certain species disappeared and why there was or wasn't overlap between human and non-human species. The last kind of major question, and one that we're really following up heavily on, is trying to learn more about the sensitivity of our climate system. So as it turns out, these stalagmites and stalactites, types are the ones that come from the top, Mites come from the bottom. They only grow when the cave was dry. As water percolates through the limestone, it drips down on the floor, evaporates, and slowly you start to get these cave formations accreting. Well, it ends up they're great recorders, just like uh, ice cores or tree rings, uh, great recorders of the environmental history at the time, the temperature and precipitation. And remember, they only grow when the cave is dry, so they're also very precise recorders of sea level rise and fall. But in addition to really solidifying some of the scientific ideas about abrupt climate change, we had some other interesting findings. That's Saharan dust. There's no natural source of the dust in the Bahamas, and it's come over, and it's come over in such massive quantities that it really led to questions of how did it get here, why in such quantities, why in certain areas of the cave. And as it turns out, it ends up that this dust is trapped in the speleothems and is exactly in line with these abrupt cooling and warming periods, what are called Heinrich events. And we have some very compelling evidence that dust is a driver as opposed to a reaction to climate changes. And that has big implications, not just for the sensitivity of the climate as we add greenhouse gases, but also has implications for land use and land change as well. This is actually from the USGS. All the water in the world, if you put it together, including the oceans, is that big blue marble. Forget the tiny one, the, the one a little bit bigger that's visible. That's all our groundwater. That's, if you take away what's locked up in ice, 95% of the world's fresh water is beneath our feet in underground reservoirs. And it all came here from space and the formation of the Earth. And it, it's, we're not creating it or destroying it. We're just moving it around and changing its nature. And, I think uh, it's something that it's hard to get perspective on, and I think you'll get it in a different way from the finite nature of what we have on Earth by looking at what Adam has to say about the infinity of space. So I think it's Adam's up next, and thank you very much.